Hi everyone and welcome to The Journey. Today as you can see, we're going to be talking about women's health and particularly perimenopause, alright? So with perimenopause, it's pretty much the period that's extending from the first sign of menopause, usually hot flashes, um, irregular menses, dryness, right? Vag vaginal dryness actually, alright? And it goes beyond the complete sensation of menses, okay? So this period would, would last until you finally are finished and you have no more menses. All right. So this period is around menopause. It's lasting one year after the last um, menstrual period. Okay. And then you want to inform your patient about the physiological changes that can occur. Right. So those women who do not know, because you know, in here in America, we talk about sexuality. We talk about things that are going to happen that, that is occurring as women in other places. Right. You may not have those talks where this is what's going to happen when you get into middle age. Um, you know, and, and so forth, and so on and so forth. So for some women, they may be taken back and may not understand what is going on with them and they may think that something is wrong or, you know, um, they have some type of illness or disease or things like that, right? So you just want to make sure that when you're dealing with patients who are, you know, from a different background, different culture, right? Because there's so many people that migrate to this, to this area that you just may never know, okay? And sometimes too, you never know where life may take you. You may travel to another place right and experience another culture another another way of living and they don't always talk about um these type of things will give those um, um sex ed education and you know um human development growth classes and things like that okay so don't be taken back if some of your patients may not know or may not um exhibit um awareness of these things okay so you want to make sure that you're educating your patient and you're letting them know all right so you want to inform them to give awareness okay so you want to teach these women about health promotion and things of how they can prevent different diseases and things like that because they're not quite there at menopause, but they're going to be. So, you know, the things that they're going to be worrying about, at least uh, a middle-aged woman, are going to be worrying about their sexuality because they still may, you know, um, still have those sexual desires and things that they want to do, right? Fertility, right? They may still want to be pregnant or still get pregnant and things like that, all right? Or contraception, all right? It's a big thing, so you want to make sure that you're educating on these material. Also, unintended pregnancy, um, breast health, right? Oral contraceptive use, right? And you want to let them know that oral contraception use is not just only prevention of pregnancy, but it can also um, protect against uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, anemia, right? And fibrocystic breast changes. So these are things that you want to inform your patients about so that they are fully aware with perimenopause, okay? So it's pretty much just the period right before you're going into your last menstruation. So, now we have menopause, right? So we talked about perimenopause, which just happened before menopause. Now we're on menopause. So, menopause is a permanent physiological sensation, which is a stop in the menstruation cycle, okay? So, um, it's also involving the client and ovarian function, okay? And with that, the reproductive uh, function is pretty much almost going on a decline, okay? Or it pretty much ends. So, um, it can happen gradually and it can give you signals where you'll see it in your menses. So you may have irregular menses, you may have an increase or decrease in the menstruation flow, so ultimately it finally stops, okay? Um, and these are some of your clinical manifestations, which are your signs and symptoms and your nursing assessment that you want to uh, watch out for for a patient who is going through menopause, okay? So you have your irregular menses, which is the menstruation that we just talked about, right? You have breast tenderness, all of a sudden they are they're tender. You have your mood changes. Um, you have your hot and warm flashes. I know you guys are probably laughing, at least the guys are probably laughing with the mood changes, right? Because you feel as if we do that all the time, which is not true, all right? All right, so um, you have your hot flashes. And the reason why you have that is because of your hormonal changes. And with your hormonal changes, there's a decrease in your basal motor instability. So that's why you're not able to maintain um, your temperatures, right? Sometimes everyone else is cold and you're hot. And everyone else is, is hot and you're cold. So it all depends, right? Um, you also have your night sweats. At nighttime, you know, they, they sweat. So they sweat profusely to the point where they wake up in the morning and they just drench, okay? Um, also, they may have sleep disturbances or discomfort. All right, and then you have subsequent fatigue where they feel very tired all the time and an increase in bone loss, okay? And the main thing that I want you guys to remember from here, yes, we have the typical things that we hear about all the time. We hear our elderly um, females complain about, you know, the, the hot flashes and the mood changes 
and things like that. But one thing that I really want you guys to at least add to that is the bone bone loss, okay? That is very, very big because that is going to cause, um, you know, uh, osteoporosis, which is why you see that more in females than in males, okay? So I want you guys to keep that in mind that this is something that can eventually lead or cause osteoporosis. So now I'm just going to go ahead and continue on with the clinical manifestation, but this is more on the on the vaginal changes, okay, because of the a decrease in estrogen level. So I'm going to have a thinning of the pubic hair. I'm going to have shrinkage of the labia, which is pretty much the lips of the of the vagina, okay. I'm going to have a decrease in vaginal secretion. So we all know women, when you're getting ready to have intercourse, your body is able to secrete a lot of uh, fluid or so, so that way it kind of acts as a lubricant for the guy. Right? There's a decrease in that. So with a decrease in that, that's why they came up with, you know, the KY jelly and the different things that, um, that you know, some women may not be able to to have a lot of secretions of. You also have this part of urea, which is pretty much discomfort in intercourse. And you can think about it. They may have discomfort because if they're not able to secrete a lot of that secretion, right, it's almost as if it's friction. That's very painful. So again, they, they may exhibit those things as well. Also, vaginal pH level may increase, which is going to cause more bacterial infections because the pH level is, is imbalanced. Also, atropic vaginitis, okay, atropic vaginitis. Also, you can have discharge, uh, vaginal discharge, right, um, itchiness or itchiness of the, of the vagina, burning of the vagina, okay, so you can be itching, burning, or vaginal discharge. All right, and then psychological consideration that the nurse should kind of take into consideration, especially if you're a female nurse, just because um, you know what it's like to be more of a woman, <laughs> right? Is a woman may feel less of a woman, right? Because all your life you've been told that, you know, your job is, is being able to reproduce and be able to have kids. And, you know, some people, you know, may take that to heart and they may think that if you don't have these female parts or you're not, you know, you're not able to have, carry out these female functions that you're not a woman, right? Because your culture told you that, or the belief of, of your faith, or a different religion and things like that. So you want to make sure that you're being there as a support guide or a support system for these patients who are going through menopause. They may end up, going, um, end up being depressed. So you just want to kind of educate them, let them know that this is just a natural process of life and that it goes through, um, it, it happens with every woman. Every woman cannot escape it. As much as we would love to escape it, Right? Um, some, of you, some of you guys probably like that. Just take my menstruation away, right? But um, again, it's just a natural process of life. So you want to make sure that you're letting her know that, letting, letting um, them know that it's okay, that this is just something that is going to happen. Okay. So now we're going to go ahead and talk about the medical management of menopause. So you have your hormonal therapy, which is also known as HT, or hormonal replace, replacement therapy, which is HRT. So if you, if you see the word HRT or HT, we're talking about the same thing, hormonal therapy, all right? So hormonal therapy, um, back at, you know, back before they had the information now, was, was said that it would decrease the risk of osteoporotic fractures, decrease cardiovascular disease, but recently, and I put that in red, because this is what's going on right now, right? Recently, they have found that it increases health disorders and less effective in preventing cardiovascular disease, okay? So, where they say here it's a decrease in cardiovascular, that is not true, okay? So, again, they have found that it increases it, okay? So, with hormonal therapy, what it does do, because you may say, then what, what, you know, what's the whole purpose of hormonal therapy, right? It does reduce the hot flashes, and it does um, decrease the risk of osteoporotic fractures and colorectal cancer, but look what you're giving up, right? Your cons for hormonal therapy, right? You have your increase in breast cancer, an increase in heart attack, an increase in stroke, and an increase in blood clots. Right, I have one, two, three, four, four to three. I think we can deal with the cop flashes for a little bit, right? And you can always take supplements and things like that that is going to um, help to prevent os um, osteoporotic fractures like your vitamin D, um, making sure that you have more calcium, right? So again, this is the education you want to give to a patient who has decided to do hormonal therapy, all right? And I put here an asterisk 
current recommendations for treatment for hot flashes, right, is that you want to use the lowest dose possible for the shortest amount of time, all right? Because again, look at the cons, all right? These are some big heavy hitter cons, right? Breast cancer that can metastasize and go into different areas. A heart attack, right? A stroke. These are two big heavy hitters in your blood clots. Your blood clots will probably cause the stroke or cause the heart attack, all right? It can also cause pulmonary embolism. There's so many different things that the clot can do because once that clot travels and it goes through the brain, that's a stroke. If it goes to the heart, that's a heart attack. You know, there's many different things. If it goes to the lung, pulmonary embolism, right? So again, again, and again. You want to make sure that you educate your patient, that they're full aware, fully aware of the pros and cons of taking hormonal therapy versus not taking hormonal therapy. I guess you can kind of already tell what side I'm on, right? I'm the natural type, and I like to use anything that's natural that's, that's, that's pretty much me, you know? The less medication I can take, the better it is. But for those of you guys, if you, um, you want to educate your patient that they may not be in a state where they're healthy enough where they can, they can rely on naturalistic um, remedies and things like that, right? They may be at a stage where this may be their only source of, of, of help and things like that. So again, you want to make that decision based on the safety of the patient and ultimately is what the patient wants. The only thing you can do is pretty much educate and let the patient know what's going on. But if you was ask me personally, I do not like hormone therapy just because there's so many more cons than there are pros, you know? And I'd rather just deal with the, the symptoms the hot flashes and the irregular menses and you know I'd rather deal with that than having to risk um, having all of these things here okay but um, I'm just here to teach you uh, the different things here so I'm just going to go ahead and continue. So now we're going to talk about the methods of administration all right so you're going to give both estrogen and progesterone to a patient or a woman who has not had a hysterectomy. And a hysterectomy is pretty much the removal of the uterus. So if a woman still has her uterus, she is going to have both estrogen and progesterone, okay? And what progesterone is pretty much going to do is prevent proliferation, and proliferation is pretty much the rapid reproduction of a cell, a part, or an organism of that, of, that, um, of that organism of the uterine lining, okay? And it also is going to have, uh, prevent hyperplasia. Which hyperplasia is pretty much an enlargement of organ or the tissue that's caused by the increase in reproduction rate of the cell. So pretty much what progesterone is doing is pretty much um, stopping the rapid reproduction of your uterine lining of the cell, okay, or the enlargement of the cell because those things can cause what? Cancer, right? It's those, it, that pretty much describes what a cancer cell is pretty much doing, right? Cancer cells are pretty much a uh, cell that's, that's going through mitosis very, very rapidly and it's not functioning in the proper way. Okay? And you have an overgrowth or buildup of it, and it pretty much invades the part, and, the, and those cells are not functioning the right way, so eventually they take over, and when they take over, they lose the function of what the body's supposed to be doing, and that's how you have different um, organs and different parts of the body that's shutting down, because yes, it's, 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 reprodu it's reproducing and, and, and going very, very fast, but it's not being proficient, it's not, it's not quality, it's quantity and not quality. Okay, so that's pretty much in a nutshell what progesterone is doing. It's preventing those overgrowth of those cells in the uterine line. So for a woman who has her uterus, it makes sense for her to have progesterone because you want to prevent that overgrowth within the uterus. Okay. Also, you have here for the estrogen only. Estrogen only is going to be for women who already have a hysterectomy that they don't have a uterus because. I don't need to take the progesterone because it works on the uterus, I don't have a uterus, right? So I don't have to worry about having uterine cancer because how can I have a cancer of a cell, of an organ that I do not have, right? So they don't have to worry about that concern, all right? Um, but with the estrogen, right, you're going to have an increase, you have a decreased risk of estrogen induced hyperplasia of the uterine lining, like I said before, right? It's going to decrease the, 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 the ability of you having endometrial cancer or anything like that because you don't have a uterus, okay? So it decreases that risk factor. But it increases the risk of a stroke in women who's taking this estrogen alone. So those women who are taking estrogen alone, right, you are at more risk of having a stroke, all right? You are at risk for having breast cancer. And you're also having a risk of dementia and any cognitive impairment, okay? So these are all related to the estrogen only. 
Um, also, you have estrogen and progesterone, right? You're going to take that daily. So it's like a pill, right, that has the estrogen and, and progesterone in it. And the, the women who do have their uterus, you would take that daily, okay? Um, the estrogen only, if you're just taking only estrogen, you're going to take it for 25 consecutive days each time out of the month. So whatever day you set, you're going to take it 25 days consecutively for that time of the month. Okay, so literally you only have five or six days off, depending if the month has 30 days or 31 days, right? And then you have progesterone, right? And progesterone is taken in cycles. So it's every 10 to 14 days out of the month. So every 10 to 14 days out of the month. So if you're just taking the, just the progesterone pill, right? Every 10 to 14 days out of the month. So again, these are um, the methods of administration. And I know it can get a little bit confusing. You may want to rewind um, this part of the video just to kind of get it over and over and over again. So we're just going to continue on with the methods of administration. So a woman who take hormonal therapy for 25 days, she often experiences bleeding after completing um, the progesterone, okay? So yeah, so one thing you want to watch out for and let the patient know is that when taking this medication that there may be signs of bleeding afterwards after completion of taking the progesterone, okay? Also, women who take both, right, they usually experience no bleeding, but they may have occasional, um, occasionally have irregular spotting, okay? So you just want to check with your healthcare provider, all right? So H HCP it stands for a healthcare provider. So sometimes you'll see that in the book or you'll see that abbreviated. That's that, that's that's what they're talking about, okay? Healthcare provider, just in case. Um, and then you have progesterone. Maybe oral, maybe transdermal, it may be vaginal, right? Or it may be interuterine. So there's different ways of how the progesterone pill can come or the medication can come. All right, you have estrogen patches, right? And you want to replace those once to twice um, weekly. And then you have estrogen and progesterone patches that are together, okay? So it has the estrogen and progesterone together in that one patch, okay? So you have the estrogen by itself, the progesterone estrogen by itself, and then you also have the progesterone, okay? And that can be oral, uh, vaginal, right? All these different ways of, of how you can administer the medication. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and talk about the application of the medication, right? So with the transderm, you wanna make sure that you apply on dry skin. You wanna cleanse the area with the alcohol pad or so, so that way you can um, um, increase the adhesiveness, okay? Also, you have vaginal treatment with the estrogen cream, a suppository, or esterol ring, which is also known as the e string. And that's pretty much used for any vaginal dryness or a tropic vaginitis, okay? Remember, we have the dryness because you have a decrease in the vaginal secretions, right? Which is, think about the KY jelly, okay? So you would use those type of treatments to help alleviate the vaginal dryness, okay? Now, the estrogen ring, all right, is a small flexible vaginal ring that slowly releases the estrogen in small doses, okay, over a three months time span, all right? And, um... It improves the um, full vaginal sensation, okay, and, also, and you also want to monitor for endometrial hyperplasia, which we talked about the hyperplasia before, the enlargement of, of an area. Of, um, so, because enlargement of the area because of the, the cell, um, the, the rapid cell growth, okay? So, again, you want to make sure that you're monitoring for that, all right? So, now we have our risks and benefits. So with hormone therapy, it's contraindicated. I put it in red so that way it can stand out, all right? So this is when you don't want to give this medication. So you don't want to give hormone therapy for women who have a history of breast cancer. Why? Because if I already have breast cancer, I'm already at risk of having um, breast cancer again. So if this medication is going to cause an increased risk of breast, breast cancer, I don't want a patient who had a history of it to now have to have this medication, okay? Also, vascular thrombosis. Why? Because remember, they're more prone to blood clots, right? If I have um, vascular thrombosis already, I'm already having some type of clot, so it's just going to increase that even more, right? Impaired liver function, because the, the medications probably have to metabolize in that area, right? And if I already have a damaged liver, right, now I have to put more strain on the liver to then metabolize this medication. You also, uterine cancer, all right? And then undiagnosed abnormal vaginal bleeding. Why? Because remember, after these, um, the consecutive um, 25 days treatment, right, after after use the, the use of progesterone, what happened? Bleeding occurs. And if I already have vaginal bleeding, it's just going to cause more vaginal bleeding that's going to decrease your hemoglobin, may cause anemic uh, episodes and things like that. So 
these women are not going to have, um, are not going to be able to take this medication, all right? Also, you want to report signs and symptoms of a DVT, which a DVT pretty much is a deep vein thrombosis, right? And it's just pretty much, it can happen anywhere. It can happen in the legs. Most of the time it happens in the legs, but it can also happen in the upper extremities as well, in the groin as well, all right? And you want to report signs and symptoms of PE, which is pulmonary embolism, okay? So what are some of those signs, right? You have your leg redness. You have your tenderness, right? You may have tenderness in that area. Chest pain, right, from the PE, or shortness of breath, all right? So those are the things that you want to make sure that um, you're stating to the patient so that way um, they're able to tell you, hey, nurse, I feel shortness of breath. Or, you know, I'm having a lot of chest pain. You know, and I was last thing I was on was this medication. Or, you know, things like that. So you want to make sure that you're in constant communication with these patients and knowing what's going on with them, all right? Also, you want to do your regular follow-up. You want to tell the patient, make sure you do your regular follow-up. You know, go see, go see your, um, go, go, go do your annual checkups, do your mammograms, things like that, right? So you want to do that physical exam, mammograms, and then also they may have to do endometrial biopsies, right, to see um, what's going on if there is irregular bleeding, right? You may want to know, is it because of a fibroid? Is it because of endometrial cancer? Why are you bleeding? So there's many different things here that um, you want to educate your patient about and want them to, to be more aware of so that way they know and they're prepared to know exactly what's going to happen, right? You want to give them the whole benefits and the risks, the pros and the cons. All right, so now we have alternative um, hormonal therapy, okay, for hot flashes. So we have your Fixer, Paxil, Neurontin, and Catapress, okay? So these are your trade names here. These are your generic names. Again, always try to remember the generic name is because that's what you're going to be tested on, okay? Some of these is a mixture of um, neurological medication, blood pressure medication, and um, antidepressant medication, okay? So some way, somehow, they also help in the effect of helping with dealing with the hot flashes, okay? But this is where I really want you guys to focus mainly on, which is why I put a separation here. So these are your more natural remedies, okay? So vitamin E and vitamin B6, right? Your black cohosh. You may say, what is a black cohosh, right? I think I believe it's a type of tea or so that they would drink as an herbal uh, remedy, okay, to help with um, the imbalance of the estrogen levels, okay? Also, you may you may use natural estrogen and progesterone. Um, um, as well, you know, there's different foods and different um, plants and things like that that, that gives off those estrogen and progesterone um, in a natural way rather than um, it being medicated, okay? And one example is pretty much soy products, right? Uh, soy products have a lot, a lot of estrogen, right? Your, your um, tofu, because that's, that's soy, right? Your soy milk, soybeans, right? It's pretty much all those things is what's is what has estrogen in, okay? So for the guys, um, in case you guys did not know, those of you guys who do drink soy milk, it does cause an increase in estrogen levels. So one thing that um, for the guys that you may want to do is you may want to come back food that's going to help get rid of all that estrogen level, okay? And um, beets and broccoli, those are good foods to eat to kind of combat um, the estrogen level if you do drink soy milk, okay? Or if you want, you can always switch to almond milk, right? Almond milk is different from soy milk and it doesn't have those properties of the, all that estrogen level okay so sometimes you may look at yourself and you may say man why am i getting boobs or why am i this why am i that and you may be wondering certain things or your temperament may change right <laughs> um so you just want to make sure that you have your proper balance of your testosterone levels for free for, for. so for guys it'll be good if you can um combat that with beets right and broccoli and i know those two there's probably others but i know those main two um will definitely kind of counteract Okay, so females, now that you guys know, right, and you, you want to do a natural natural way, you're taking soy products, and let's say you just love broccoli and beets, you kind of want to um, limit your intake because you're kind of undoing um, what you're trying to gain, which is more estrogen, okay? So um, make sure you're aware of certain foods that carry certain properties, so that way you know that, hey, I'm, I'm taking this, but it's not working, right? But you're taking something else that's combating the, the, the very thing that you're trying to get, right? All right, you also have Jensen, you also have Nonquil, and then you have other um, herbal preparations, all right? And none of these things have been tested 
to show that it does have an increase or it doesn't have an increase. And then again, you have to, to remember, a lot of studies, a lot of research do not go into herbal um, remedies, so you won't find a lot of information about it. You know, the most you'll get is stuff that you'll find online, or maybe stuff from an herbal doctor and things like that, who actually took, who actually takes time and actually study. But there's no money in it just because um, they, they push a lot of pharmaceutical businesses and things like that. So of course, you know, there's no money or going into research to find out what these herbal um, things or remedies are doing, right? For one, you know, it's costly. You know, very costly to find different research and things like that. And if you don't have the funding to know exactly what's going on herbally, you know, on an herbal level, what, what the body can and, um, get from those things, you're never going to know, right? And also, it doesn't make any money, all right? Because I can just grow this in my backyard rather than going to CVS or Walgreens and paying $300 for a pill that I have to constantly get because I can't make that pill, right? So a lot of times when you're... When you're studying or you're doing things about um, herbal medication, not the fact that it does not work, it's just not enough funding to, 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 to have research provide information about what is going on, just because at the end of the day, that's not going to make a pharmaceutical company money, because I can always grow that in my backyard. So just keep, a, keep, a mind, keep in mind that aspect of it, so it's not the fact that it doesn't work, but it can just be the fact that there's no research and knowing exactly what it's doing just because of the funding. Okay, so you want to educate your patient that it doesn't mean it does not work, it just doesn't have any information about that funding. Okay, so you always want to give that option of natural remedies as well as the pharmaceutical remedies. Okay, and I put an asterisk here. All right, glucose level may affect the hot flashes, so you want to make sure that you maintain a, a stable um, blood glucose level. Right. So maintaining bone health. All right, so when you have a deterioration of the bone tissue, it occurs because of menopause and it can lead to an increase in bone fragility and also a risk for fractures, right? So naturally in itself, women are going to be more prone just because we don't we don't have um, the estrogen and progesterone that also helps aid with bone health, okay? So when we're going through menopause, we're going to have an increase in the fact that we naturally um, don't have those things to facilitate um, bone health, so um, we're more prone for um, uh, fractures and things like that, okay? So these are some other factors that can also play a part, not just only for menopause, right? But you can have a thin body frame, right? Very, very petite, very skinny, right? If you was to fall or anything like that, you're going to fall and, and break something, right? Also, depend on race. This tends to happen more in Caucasian and Asian women. So women who are going to experience bone loss or have more, um, um, Cases of osteoporosis are tends, tends to be your Caucasian woman and Asian woman. Okay, also a family history of it. Um, Nelly Pari. Nelly Pari just pretty much means a woman who's never been pregnant or a woman who's been pregnant but never been able to carry past 20 weeks. Okay, also um, moderate to heavy alcohol ingestion. All right, so that's another factor that can play. Smoking is another factor, right? Caffeine use, sedimentary lifestyle, which pretty much means a lifestyle that's not really active. Not really doing too much, not really exercising, right? Also, a decrease in our calcium intake, right? And then also just being a woman. Like I said, we are more prone than men, and 80% experience bone loss, okay? So out of all the women, 80% is going to experience bone loss. That's a big, high, high, high percentage, okay? And also, again, you just want to educate your patient because if they're not in menopause and they're already experiencing bone loss and things like that, these, some of these factors can be changed, right? As far as um, the smoking, the caffeine use, the sedimentary lifestyle, right? Pretty much these, these, these last four right here. Being a woman, we can't change that, right? Even if you do do surgeries and operations and things like that, genetically wise, your chromosome is always going to be XX. And it, with that, it's not going to change, okay? You can change the exterior part, but anatomy wise, you're always going to be that. So you can't change this factor in, 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 in play, okay? You're going to go through the menopause, all right? Um, the thin body frame, you may not be able to. You know, it all depends. Some factors you can, some factors you can't. So just the one that you're able to, you want to make sure that you're you know, educating the patients so that way they kind of modify it so later on when they do go through menopause, they have more of a, a, a base to stand on just because 
Um, they've been doing everything in, the can in their might to pretty much stay at their maximum level of bone, um, bone, bone mass, so that way when menopause does hit, when they do take a dip, it's not too, too hard. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and talk about the treatment and care for a patient who does have osteoporosis because of the menopause, right? So one thing you want to do is you want to teach them weight-bearing activities like walking, all right? Walking is very helpful to maintain bone mass, okay? Also, you want to tell them about calcium supplements, and of course, if they're going to take calcium supplements, they're going to need vitamin D. And sometimes, you know, they may be taking the calcium, but lack the vitamin D. And for some for some reason, the anatomy works where um, one aids the other into getting into the bone. So if you only have one, it's not any 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 good, right? You want to have both. You want to have calcium and vitamin D. Vitamin D, all you have to do is just literally stay out in the sun for 15 minutes, and your body is able to produce its own vitamin D. All right, so if you take your calcium and supplements, make sure you go out in the sun for at least 15 minutes. By that time, you can be doing your walking for your 15 minutes, right? So not only do you increase or maintain your bone mass, but you also get your vitamin D to now absorb the calcium, all right? Also, you want to decrease or stop smoking, okay? So like I said before, with the different factors, some, some factors we're able to change. Some, of course, we can't, like the fact that we're a woman. We can't change that that factor, right? But we can change some of the things that is going to um, only decrease the functioning of our bone, right? And then last but not least, any pharmacological meds that is there to reduce bone loss, okay? All right, so now we have maintained in the cardiovascular health, all right? So you want to have diet and exercise. And of course, that is a very, very big thing. You want to be jogging, you want to be running, right, or walking. You want to do that at least four times a week. Okay? And what it's going to do, it increases your heart rate, it strengthens your heart, right? And it also increases your HDL, which HDL is pretty much your good cholesterol levels, okay? So those are the good ones that you want to have in your body because those help to aid and get rid of the bad cholesterol, which is LDL, all right? So if you ever um, need to remember, HDL, happy, happy um, cholesterol levels, right? Those are your good ones. LDLs, your low, right? Your sad, depressed, those are your bad ones, all right? So just in case if you needed something to kind of remember HDLs from LDLs, all right? Now, you want to have stress reduction, right? Reducing stress, all right? And then any pharmacological meds in case, you know, you're at a stage where you need medication to help with your heart function, and that can be aspirin, it can be beta blockers, or your statins. And your statins is pretty much your cholesterol medication, all right? And then you have behavioral strategies. So behavioral strategies, you have some preventative care here. You want to make sure that you have um, any regular, regular health screening for menopause, which is your GYN exam, your mammograms, your colonoscopy, um, your fecal oculate blood testing, and then your bone mineral density testing as well. Okay. And for your behavioral strategies, I just pretty much just saying that. This, these are the behaviors that you want to have in an exhibit, right? You want to practice good health practices of maintaining and you know checking up on your on your annual follow, you know on your annual follow-ups that you're there that you're doing everything that you're supposed to be doing. Okay, those are the behavioral strategies that you want that's going to improve your health. Last but not least, we have our nutritional therapy, right? And what you want to do is you want to decrease the fat and calorie intake. You want to increase whole grain, fiber, fruits, and vegetables. You want to increase calcium intake, which some foods that are that have some calcium is you have your non-fat uh, yogurt, you have green leafy vegetables, you have seafood, and then you, of course your calcium fortified foods. Okay. Also, you want to make sure that you have your vitamin D supplement, which I already say the reason why because it helps aid the facility uh, to, to aid the, to facilitate the fact of calcium getting into the bones. Okay. Also, your nurse interventions. So one thing. Is the, which is the main thing, is that you want to let your patient know that there is life after menopause, okay? So if they're going through menopause, it is normal that, they, that, that their menses are going to stop, okay? So some women may think that this is what I've, I've been made to do, is to just, you know, give birth. But it's more than just giving birth, okay? So you want to let them know that it's normal, it's completely normal, all right? Those who have different cultural background, different beliefs, right? And they think that you're only a woman because you're able to reproduce and now that you don't have that anymore, you're no longer a woman. You don't you want to educate them and let them know that this is a natural process, this is normal. Alright? Also, there's 30 to 35 years of life after menopause. So it has to tell you that there's more to life than just 
being able to give birth, right? What about the women who are not able to give birth, you know, even when there was in their menstruation um, ages, right? So you want to let them know that there's still life after menopause and that, you know, they want to maintain their health and, you know, continue on with their health screens and health promotions and, you know, a, a, a good lifestyle, active lifestyle, right? And you also want to let them know that, you know, you're still going to have sexual urges, and, you know, just because you no longer have your menses, that doesn't mean that you don't still have your sexual desires and the things that you're attracted to, right? It may be a little bit difficult, but there's all other alternatives, right? You have your KY jelly or your lubricant jelly and things like that. Um, um, there's, there's ultimately a whole bunch of resources out there for you to continue on and live life because, again, most of these women live 30 to 35 plus years after menopause, okay? So that is your big thing that you want to educate your patient that it's not over after menopause, all right? So again, thank you for watching this video. If you found it very informative, go ahead and click the like button, um, share it with someone. If you haven't subscribed already, go ahead and do so. Um, for extra information that I have not mentioned on the video, be sure to check the description box. And again, if you want to leave a comment or you have any concerns or questions, please don't forget to go ahead and put that in the comment section below. And thank you for coming on this journey. Thanks for watching.